Okay, good afternoon and welcome. My name is Libby Bischoff and I'm the Executive Director of the Osher Map Library and Smith Center for Cartographic Education here at the University of Southern Maine in a very chilly um, early afternoon in the city of Portland. We are delighted to welcome all of you to this afternoon Zoom webinar with Matt Brown and Reese Davis and Mike Hall the authors and illustrator of the newly published Atlas of Imagined Places from Lilliput to Gotham City. And if you're wondering why uh, we chose to host the event at noon on a Saturday, um, it's because our guests are based in the UK and Spain, and we wanted to respect the time difference. Um, today's event serves as the opening celebration for our brand new exhibition, North of Nowhere, West of the Moon, Myth, Fiction, and Fantasy and Maps, which as of yesterday morning is now on view in our gallery and will soon be available online um, on our website, oshermaps.org. So you can visit the online version in a few short weeks if you cannot travel to Maine to see the exhibit in person prior to the end of May when it closes. Much like Matt, Reese, and Mike's Atlas, the show is colorful and whimsical, eclectic, and full of surprises. And for those of you who are local, we will drop the link in the chat and you can book yourself a free time ticketed gallery visit. Um, we're open to visitors external to the University of Southern Maine, Tuesdays through Fridays, 10 to four, and on Saturdays from 10 to three. And because we have an international audience with us this afternoon, if you would like to, you are more than welcome to say hello in the chat and tell us where you are listening from this afternoon or this evening, uh, as the case may be, wherever it is that you are. So thank you so much for being here. Just a couple of logistics. Um, as we're approaching the third year of the pandemic, we guess that you're probably all very intimately familiar with Zoom, uh, but we'll offer just a few quick reminders. Our program today is a Zoom webinar, which is a little different than the day-to-day -day Zoom that you might be more familiar with. That means that all of our audience members will remain muted and invisible for the duration of the presentation. After our guests present, we will be excited to field your questions in a live Q&A. I will moderate the discussion. So whenever you have a question, you are more than welcome to go to the bottom of your screen, hit that Q&A box and type your question in there. And we will happily um, get to those at the end of the session. Um, the event is being live captioned. So if you would like to have the closed captions appear on your screen, just go to the bottom of your screen and hit the CC button on the lower right, um, and you'll be able to see those. We suggest speaker view for the best viewing experience this afternoon. You're gonna see um, a lot of screen sharing going on between our authors. So uh, that view will be the best to see everything that's being offered. And we are recording the program. So if you have any friends and family um, who wanted to be here today, but couldn't rest assured that they will be able to see the program. Before I introduce our speakers, I just wanted to offer a few words of thanks to everyone who made today possible, especially Jess Hovey, our amazing operations and communications manager, our ITMS team at USM for their technological assistance on all of our webinars, and Patty White, our live captioner. A special thank you to the Osher Map Library Foundation for underwriting the costs of today's event. And now, without further ado, just a few notes about our speakers. Matt Brown describes himself as an absolute map geek who once, on a very drawn out whim, read every single Charles Dickens novel and mapped all the locations before doing the same for Virginia Woolf, Jane Austen, and the Sherlock Holmes stories. He is the author of 10 books and currently serves as an editor at large of Londonist.com. Reese Davis was born and raised in West Wales and as a 90s kid, 
consumed all sorts of Saturday morning cartoons, blockbuster films, and a lot of literature from Enid Blyton to Road Dahl. He is a deep lover of fiction and imagined worlds. And his first novel, Time Wreck Titanic, was published in 2012. And finally, Mike Hall, a self-proclaimed obsessive map maker and freelance illustrator who is currently based in Spain. He grew up drawing maps of places both real and imagined, uh, including his hometown of Harlow, England, a graduate of the University of Westminster in London. He now maps worlds and creates architectural drawings for HarperCollins, Penguin, the Royal Horticultural Society, and many more happy clients. So thank you, gentlemen, for uh, tuning in and being with us today. And I am going to turn it over to Matt to get us started. Uh, thank you very much, Libby. That's a wonderful introduction. I'm just going to share my screen. Now, hopefully everybody can see my slides. Um, so as, as Libby said, I'm, I'm Matt Brown, and uh, I came up with the idea for this atlas a few years back now. Um, I'm going to give you a very sort of brief introduction of where it came from, where this idea came from, and how we put it together. Um, I'm actually speaking to you from just north of London in the UK. Um, I'm in a town called Boreham Wood, which not many people have heard of. Even people who live in London haven't necessarily heard of it. But it is, it's our country's answer to Hollywood in many ways. We've got Boreham Wood, you've got Hollywood. We don't have the palm trees and the sunshine, uh, but we do have some major film studios here. And I'm lucky enough to live in a flat where when I open my windows, I can see where the first Star Wars movies were filmed and where Indiana Jones was filmed and The Shining. And, and to, to this day, there are still major uh, productions made here. So it's always felt while I've been working on this atlas, I felt like I'm in the middle of it all. I can I can see the set of The Crown from my window. I feel like I'm part of the movie industry, even though I'm not. I, I've not, no connections with it whatsoever, but it's all there out of my window. Um, so just to set the scene of where, where I am in the world. Um, the atlas itself, it's hard to pinpoint a single moment where the idea came from. So for those who haven't already seen it, it's 5,000 or so locations, places that don't actually exist in real life. They're from novels, comics, films, TV shows, computer games, um, but places you can nevertheless map, you can put onto a map somewhere. So Gotham City is very easy to map to New Jersey area. And uh, we've got all these places around London where all the soap operas around here are filmed. And there's 5,000 of these spanning the whole globe. We've got everything from Antarctica to China to three, uh, six pages of, of the USA, because obviously so many fictional places have been set in the USA. And um, so the idea came, well, I've, I've always been a mapper since I was a kid. I'm one of those people who read Tolkien and read lots of fantasy epics, Game of Thrones, all that. And I loved the maps in those things. And I'd go off and draw my own in my spare time. I'd make up imaginary worlds. Um, I was never much of an artist, though. So it was more of an exercise in just geekdom rather than any kind of artistry. But I loved the process of, of geography and laying out the land and making up place names. Um, as I got older, I, I kind of strayed away from that. I went into the sciences. I'm a scientist by training. Um, but I got into science writing and eventually I wrote, started writing about London for a living, and I um, helped to set up the website Londonist.com. I don't know if any of you have ever visited it. It's just a, a guide to things to do in London. We also go into the history and culture of, of the city. Um, but something I always liked to experiment with on Londonist was mapping, mapping anything I could. Uh, we're very blessed in London to have so many iconic maps. You've all seen the tube map. It's a, it's a world icon. Um, and I, I love playing and tinkering with the, with the tube map. In fact, just before the pandemic and, and the lockdowns, I was working on a tube map of smells. So I was going to each tube station, sniffing the air and then annotating it on a map of the tube as to what each station smelt like. Uh, of course, a few months later, that, that kind of activity would become illegal because <laughs> we're all wearing these face masks and not supposed to travel. Um, but th those are the kind of sort of creative ideas I, I was doing for Londoners and still do to this day. And um, the Atlas of Imagined Places really had its genesis then in one of those maps. It was the Dickens map that uh, Libby already mentioned. I'm just going to briefly show you it. Uh, this is a zoomed in version of the centre of London. It's a bit of a mess in that view. You'd have to sort of zoom in to see it properly. But every one of those coloured coloured pins 
is a location from a Dickens novel. So I read every single novel and every time somewhere was mentioned, I stuck it on a Google map and each of those pins has got an annotation to tell you this is where the Artful Dodger met Oliver Twist, this is where Fagin's den is, et cetera, et cetera. You can see over on the left there, Pickwick Papers alone has 196 or actually 200 pins. Um, so across all his novels, there's thousands of, of things. That took me two years to do. And then I went on to do it for various other novels. But as I was doing that, I was noticing Dickens has this wonderful way of also making up place names. Um, most famously, his novel Hard Times is set in a gritty North England town uh, called Coke Town. And um, his, his various Pickwick papers is full of them. There's Dingley Dell and all these lovely southeastern place names. Um, so I, I didn't know how to map those. That a lot of them were very difficult to place. That you know they're in somewhere in the north or somewhere in the southeast, um, but no firm place to put them. And um, so I left those off this map. But they were always nagging away at the back of my mind. I was thinking, surely there's a, some kind of atlas or map that could be done here to to map those places that are, are kind of real in fiction but not real in real life and that idea eventually evolved into this which was um so i say i'm no artist but i, I can sort of use photoshop and, and do a, a rough um, map of the uk in, in photoshop so this is what i did this is fake britain and it's uh, this is about a thousand places from across, uh, well, it's England, Scotland, and Wales. We didn't stray over into Ireland and Northern Ireland for reasons we could maybe pick up later in the Q and A. But um, every single thing on here, you might not be able to see very clearly on your screens, but we've got just in the Southeast alone, every spare pixel is taken up with a place name. We found so many places. And um, I originally made this map with say a hundred places. And the beauty of running a website like Londonist is we can put it out there and ask our readers to contribute their own ideas. So crowdsourcing uh, additional things. And people obviously watch shows, watch films, play computer games that I've, I've never even heard of. So they were able to contribute loads of additional points to our map. And one of those people was Reese Davis, who's uh, gonna be up next, who came back uh, very soon after the first iteration of this map was published with an exceptional list. I mean, I can't remember how many Reese you, you came up with, but it was dozens and dozens of places. I mapped those, I added those to the map, and then he came back with another load and another load, and it kept going. And in the end, I just said, look, Reese, you've been so helpful here. I, I'm going to have to give you co-authorship on this map. Um, so ever since it's been a, a joint production, and we've, we've kind of kept this up to date uh, to the present day. Um, and if you found this on Londonist, if you want to, to look at this, this first version, just search for fake Britain Londonist, that's London IST. You'll find there's, uh, alongside the map, there's also a, a spreadsheet of every single place name, the source it came from, be it TV, film, book, uh, and some little annotation with a bit more detail on, on how we decided where it should go on the map. Um, so this did enormously well, It's it's still, racking up the page views on London is today. We sell posters of it. I think we might have even put it on a tea towel that you can buy through our shop. Um, but after it was, after a year or so, after it was doing so well, uh, Reese and I thought, well, can we do this trick again with maybe the USA or, or Ireland or some other territory? And then we thought, hang on, why don't we just try and do the whole world? Let's be ambitious about this. How many fictional places have ever been created in the whole world? And of course, it's a, a never ending task. There's always new stuff coming out. There's always stuff we're going to miss, stuff we're not aware of. Uh, but nevertheless, we managed to, over a year and a half, two years, um, rack up about 5,000 places. It's probably actually more like six or 7,000, but we did have to, to choose and edit our, our list down because you just can't fit it all on some of these maps. Um, but I, I'm lucky enough, I've been published a few times already, and I, I went to my publisher with the idea of turning this into an atlas. Uh, Batsford is the publisher, and they were delighted with the idea. They immediately said yes. Um, the first thing they said was that can we can we um, can we lose your maps? Matt, they're they're good, but they're not they're not quite as artistic as as could be. Uh, we need something really nice and visual uh, to sell this atlas. Um, so that's when I thought of Mike. Uh, Mike Hall is. Uh, an astounding body of work over his career. He continues to churn out some brilliant maps. And um, we've featured him several times on Londonist. So he was my first thought when, when I needed uh, to find an illustrator to, to help with this project. I immediately thought of Mike. And uh, Mike will be up uh, after Reese, just telling you a bit more about 
the illustration process and how we stuck the pins on the map and, and the practical side of it. Um, Reese is going to talk to you now, though. He's he's the real detail man. He's he's the ultra geek who know he doesn't just know and watch a load of stuff and read a load of books and know a load of stuff. He remembers it all as well. I mean, I was heavily involved with the mapping and helping find the data points and writing the book. Uh, but I, it's, it's all gone from my head now a year later after we wrote it. But I bet it's all fresh in Reese's head because he's just amazing. Um, so, Reese, I've, I've bigged you up. I'm going to um, hand you over now to, to give a few examples. So I'll just um, um, go back to this and stop sharing. OK, Reese, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Matt. And I'm assuming everyone can see me OK. <laughs> I hope so. So it's my turn to share and uh, take over. So let's go for it. And fingers crossed, this should be working. So it all began with Fake Britain and it's a great, it was a great honor to be included in its creation by Matt and a great honor to be part of the Atlas and even more so to be here today. Thank you so much to the University of Southern Maine whose motto is apparently the University of Everyone, which is not so different from my old college motto, everywhere else is nowhere. And that was Furness College at Lancaster University, based at just around there and named for the Furness region of Cumbria in northwestern England. It was kind of appropriate then that I ended up on a project that is all about locations and places, given that I went to, to a college that was literally named for a place. And to talk you through the process of mapping and how we found these locations, I guess the best way to start is with America's television cultural capital, its most famous fictional town, Springfield, USA, hometown of the Simpsons. What can you say about Springfield? It's any town in USA. Its location is intentionally vague and jokey. I mean, as the movie said, it borders Ohio, Nevada, Maine and Kentucky simply impossible and at one point the solution we were discussing was to literally put a Springfield dot in every single state of the union but that felt honestly unsatisfying so we had to try and nail down a bit more and look into the canon of the Simpsons so what can we say we can say that Springfield was founded in frontier times by a reasonably rugged group of pioneers that set off from Maryland in 1796 after misinterpreting a passage in the Bible. Their destination, New Sodom. They were led in this by Jebediah Springfield, who, however, had a secret identity as notorious pirate Hans Sprungfeld. So Jebediah, in beginning his own personal history, might explain why Springfield is a little bit murky. So let's look at the topography. Springfield can have anything that the story demands, from temperate forests to mountain peaks to a coastline to desert badlands. I mean, it's frankly impossible. And yet, yet it keeps on throwing out clues. It, we know it's in a fictional state, the, though the state flag has changed from episode to episode, going from not just another state to this Confederate embarrassment especially since Springfield apparently fought on the North in the, in the wars between the states. And some episodes even give us a map where Springfield here is located right in the heart of the USA, but that doesn't match at all with what's been shown in the show itself. However, there is a clue. In some episodes, you can see that Springfield's area code has the state abbreviation NT or TA, and this ties into an interview that one of the show's directors gave in its early years saying that Springfield does, in, does indeed take place in a fictional state and that state's name is North Tacoma. And suddenly everything slots into place because Tacoma is the old Salish name for Mount Rainier, the highest peak in the Pacific Cascades. So Springfield, ergo, is in the Pacific Northwest. And indeed, appropriately, that's where Matt Groening, the show's creator, is from. He was born in Portland, Oregon, not Maine, and went to university in Washington State. So based on all these clues and the fact that this mural that you're seeing right now is an official endorsed mural in Springfield, Oregon, which Matt has said was the inspiration for the place name, we are absolutely confident in placing Springfield in the Pacific Northwest in the fictional state of North Tacoma, which also allowed us to map its hated rival, Shelbyville, 
and a range of other locations from the Springfield Canon. And as you can see, the Pacific Northwest is quite well populated with fictional locations. You've got things such as Dante's Peak from the uh, Pierce Brosnan film, uh, Mystery Mountain and Gravity Falls from the Disney television show of the same name, v locations from The Ring with Moresco Island, and down here, a cluster of locations familiar to anyone who grew up with these classic films, The Goonies, Kindergarten Cop, and Short Circuit, which are all set in the same real town, Astoria, Oregon, right on the mouth of the Columbia River. Now, although most of the locations in Astoria are fictional, uh, are real in these films, there are some fictional ones. For example, the Inferno, the pirate ship of One-Eyed Willie, and the Goon Docks, where the Goonies hail from. And just across the river in Washington, we have the fictional town of Damon, home of Nova Robotics, where Johnny Five of Short Circuit was born. Ignore the zip code. That's actually the zip code for Guadalupe in Mexico. <laughs> so Damon was easy to map, but Short Circuit 2 took things in a different direction. Now, in between movies, Johnny Five was hiding out in the big, big sky state of Montana. But in the sequel, he up sticks to what the poster described as the big, bad city. But where do we map this city? Well, in the script, which can be found online with enough searching, it's apparently meant to be New York. But here's a bit of a problem. A New York tourist guide in the script becomes one with the St. Louis Arch in the actual film. A location described as Times Square in the film is clearly anything but. But there is a clue. All the vehicles in this film have the same pattern of license plate, blue lettering on a white background with the motto, yours to discover. Well, what great state of the union has that pattern of license plate? Ontario. Oh, Canada. Budget crunch in action. The film was originally planned to be set in New York, but budget, requi budget requirements had them shift to location to shooting in Toronto, which resulted in the script being scrubbed of most references to New York which is why Johnny Five is sworn as, as, as an American citizen, not on Liberty Island, but in front of the Ontario Legislature Building. And you can actually see some Canadian flags back there, which the local government refused to allow to be taken down, and so which had to be hidden by a lot of stars and stripes. So where do we put this city? It can't be New York, but it's got to be somewhere, somewhere close to Canada to justify all those Ontario license plates. And another, delete, another altered line gives us a clue. In the film, Johnny looks for 135 West Lafayette Boulevard as opposed to 57th Street. And there is a West Lafayette Boulevard in Detroit. And in the climactic chase, Johnny identifies the street they're traveling on as Lakeshore. Right, Great Lakes area. Perfect. Brilliant. Somewhere near enough to St. Louis to justify that travel guide. Somewhere with access to the lakes. Somewhere near to Detroit. Somewhere near to Ontario. It's all coming together. In fact, it's right here, or it would be if that city was given a name. So unfortunately, the big bad city is not on this atlas, even though we'd absolutely love to map it after all the effort that was put into trying to nail down its location. Some places, however, are far simpler. I'm guessing everyone's familiar with this town. Bedrock, first with fire, home of the Flintstones the modern Stone Age family. And thanks to the underrated 1994 live action film, which John Goodman perfectly played the role of Fred Flintstone, we know exactly where it's located because the film opens with a TWA A-line, Triassic World Airlines, descending into bedrock with the captain noting that on the left, you'll be able to see the Grand Canyon in about 15 million years. Arizona. Just south of the Grand Canyon in real life, there was for many years a Flintstones Bedrock City theme park. And there is a theme park called the Bedrock River Adventure, which meant that we could not only map Bedrock to Arizona near the Grand Canyon, but turn the Bedrock River into a forebear of the mighty Colorado back when it was just a trickle. Other easy locations to map from the center of America include Somerville, the fictional town from last year's Ghostbusters Afterlife. Now, even though the film came out after the book went to press, we had Somerville mapped way, way in advance, over a year in advance. Thanks to this map from the trailer, 
which clearly shows Somerville, Oklahoma, to be in the same location as real wood, Woodward, Oklahoma. Yeah, I went on to Google Earth and with a lot of nerdy effort, managed to map all these highways up to a real town. As Matt said, I am the super nerd and I'm proud of that. But on the subject of horror, let's turn to New England. All of these pleasant terrors aside, it is in New England what we find what H.P. Lovecraft described as the true epicure of the terrible, to whom a new frill of unutterable ghastliness is the chief end and justification. Backwards New England, where the dark elements of strength, solitude, grotesqueness and ignorance combine to perform the perfection of the hideous. And as can be seen from a glance at our map, New England is indeed the home of the horrible. You have H.P. Lovecraft's own Lovecraft country down here along the valley of the Miskatonic River, shadow-haunted Arkham, horrific Innsmouth, dreadful Dunwich. And then just up north, you have King Country, the home of Stephen King's creations, Derry, Castle Rock, Shawshank, Salem's Lot. And right in between, a place that we somewhat forgot, because we didn't discover this till afterwards. For if Massachusetts is Lovecraft country and Maine is King country, then New Hampshire is fictional Kane country. This comes from the horror film In the, Mountain of, In the Mouth of Madness, a loving tribute to both Lovecraft and King, revolving around the writings of a horror writer named Sutter Kane, who resides in the equally fictional town of Hobbs End, right in the heart of New England, in the middle of New Hampshire. Of course, there are gentler horrors up here too. It's not all nightmares. You've got Casper the Friendly Ghost Home in Whipstaff Manor, right next door to the real town of Friendship, Maine, a town whose name is so quirky that as a kid I was convinced it was fictional. And then you've got all the other strange oddities that swarm into this corner of the world. Lovecraft described it as the epicure of the terrible, and perhaps it's something akin to how Bram Stoker described, described Transylvania, an imaginative whirlpool into which every superstition has been swirled. This is the corner of the world in which we have the haunting of Hill House in Massachusetts, or Professor X's School for Gifted Youngsters in Westchester County, New York, or Friar, New Hampshire, where the horrors of the Yellow Brick Road horror film take place. And then just up on the border of Massachusetts and uh, New York, you have Mount Greylock. This is where in the world of Harry Potter, America's prime school of witchcraft and wizardry is located, Ilvermorny. And in the web comic Misfile, this is location of Tempest, where a stoned angel's failure at working heaven's filing system has caused several teenagers' lives to be mixed up and muddled. There's everything up here. In fact, about the only thing that seems to be missing is giant robots. Oh, wait. I think everyone here is probably possibly familiar with the 1999 animated classic, The Iron Giant, by, directed by Brad Bird, set in the fictional town of Rockwell, named for the epicure of American uh, folksy artwork, Norman Rockwell. Rockwell is really easy to map because the actual film gives us its coordinates down to the fifth decimal place. It's right up on the coast of Maine. Rockwell, as I said, is named for Norman Rockwell, and it's meant to evoke a small town American idyll. But the origin of the Iron Giant is British. It's based on a book called The Iron Man by Ted Hughes, who at the time was Britain's poet laureate. Now, he died in 1999, unfortunately, a year before the film was released. But he thoroughly endorsed a copy of the script. He loved what Brad Bird was doing with the project, as you can see from the quote on screen. Other attempts to translate British ideas into New England, and Maine in particular, have not been quite so successful. Dad's Army, which will be familiar, I'm sure, to anyone tuning in from Britain, is perhaps the Britain's most beloved classic comedy, a World War II story about the exploits of the Home Guard, a sort of civilian militia that was set up to guard against a potential invasion during World War II. The show ran for nine years in Britain and was so popular that two attempts were made to, try to bring it to America. The second attempt got a pilot, but it went over like a lead balloon. The first attempt only exists as a script, but it gives us a location that feels wonderfully realized, even though it never made it to film. 
That is the fictional town of Tulls Point in Maine. And it's here that the cast of Dad's Army were translated into a wonderful, wonderful set of American characters. A greengrocer becomes the owner of a diner. An English spiff becomes the owner of the local pool room. You can see how this is going. But what about Tolls Point itself? Well, as well as having a wonderful population, it has a local law. For as anyone from Tolls Point will tell you, it wasn't Paul Revere who said the British are coming. No, no, believe me, the first person to say it was Thomas Tull, the founder of this town. Paul Revere stole the idea and got all the headlines because he had a fancy name, which immediately tells us that wherever Tolls Point is, it's probably pretty close to Boston. So on our map, you'll find it right down in southern Maine, near enough for Thomas Tull to warn that the English are coming and for Paul Revere to steal the idea. The swine. And the third example I've got of a British attempt to place a location in this corner of New England is the short-lived television series Tugs. Set in the fictional big city port during the roaring 1920s, Tugs was made by the people who gave us Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends and detailed the exploits of two rival tugboat fleets each vying for business within the heart of this booming international port. It only ran for one season in Britain and never got an American release, which probably would have secured it further, show, further episodes. But one of its creators did go on to create Theodore Tugboat on the same concept, set in, an Ameri- in a Canadian port, clearly based on Halifax. But what of big city ports? Well, the show was meticulously researched and takes inspiration from both the east and the west coasts of America. One of the two tug fleets is based almost certainly on the Moran Towing Corporation of America's east coast, whereas some of the other vessels of the Starfleet are based to, are one-to-one replicas of actual vessels now preserved in San Francisco. They've just been given faces. So that's a bit of a toss-up, east or west. Let's look at some other clues. Okay, so big city, At Big City, the sun rises to seaward and sets to landward. Right, east coast. We have transatlantic ocean liners, further clarification. We've got Art Deco skyscrapers and a suspension bridge suggestive of New York. We have colonial era architecture, definitely New England. And winters so icy that icebergs can drift down from Greenland and the port can freeze up in extreme circumstances. And most vitally, we have a major river estuary and upriver logging operations. It could only be Maine. And that is consequently where we placed big city port, right up there, close enough to Boston and New York, the two historic centers of transatlantic commerce to compete with them as the biggest port in the world and ideally suited for the transatlantic liners. And it's also up here that you'll see so many of the other locations that we've discussed mapped documented and put in place. Right down to Bedford Falls from It's a Wonderful Life, or Yarnathé, the drowned city that lies off the coast of Innsmouth, where the old ones dwell and dream in the deep. Oh, such horror. And returning to Britain, where we almost finish, almost where I almost finish, (laughs) we see big cities railway-based counterpart, the island of Sodor, down there off the, co- off the coast of Cumbria. We have locations from American fiction, such as McDuck Castle from DuckTales, the ancestral residence of Scrooge McDuck. We have James Bond's home of Skyfall Lodge, where he grew up as a lad. And, most beloved to a generation of readers, Hogwarts. Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. And even though J.K. Rowling tells us that this is unplottable, We've been able to devise and derive from her own words where it's located. Although the films place Hogwarts in the Western Highlands, in the books, it's clearly somewhere near to the real town of Avonmore. Sirius Black passes through the real nearby town of Dufftown on his way to Hogwarts. And in the Harry Potter and the Cursed Child stage play, Harry's son is able to walk from Hogwarts to the real town of Avonmore in less than a night. It could only be there. And I'm almost finished now, and I'm almost ready to hand off to Mike. But before I do, I'm going to take one last jaunt to the bottom end of the world, to Antarctica. And if there's one place more terrifying than New England or Transylvania, it's got to be what we called the nightmare continent. 
This is where H.P. Lovecraft placed the Mountains of Madness. This is where the spaceship of the Thing crashed. This is where the savage land where dinosaurs still live reigned in Marvel Comics. This is where humanity almost was brought to extinction in the third impact, when a giant explosion in the opening of the anime Neon Genesis Evangelion caused a tidal wave that killed half of humanity. But this cuteness here too, lots of beloved penguins and actual historical oddities. For as you can see, our Antarctica is not a single landmass, but divided in two. This was actually how Antarctica was believed to exist in up until the early 20th century, around the 1920s or 30s, it was believed that Antarctica was two landmasses divided by a strait. And that is reflected in fiction, for many authors placed islands within this location. And we mapped it as such, not only because it allowed us to include these fiction locations, but because it reflected a real geologic, geographical historical oddity. And now that we're on to subjects of cartography and geography, I'm going to hand us over to Mike. Thanks very much, Reese. Well, that was uh, that was marvellous. So for the second time, I find myself in the uh, unenviable position of following Reese uh, in a talk. <laughs> um, so, OK, so one second while I share my screen. Now then, Google Chrome, share. Okay, and all right then. So this should be this should be up and running, hopefully. Yep, I think so. Right. So yes. So hello to everyone. Thanks for joining tonight. And so um, yes, my name is Mike, and I work as a freelance illustrator and map maker. And it's fair to say that pretty much all my work nowadays involves creating maps. Um, and this is probably one of the biggest projects I've ever taken on, and certainly the most fun. Um, you know, it's, it was amazing to be given an opportunity to kind of map the whole world, whereas up until now I've kind of mapped individual cities or much, much smaller locations. Um, and obviously this, you know, as, as well as all the work that went into all the research to find all these uh, locations around the world. Um, you know, obviously there's, there was a lot of work obviously went into uh, creating the maps themselves too. Um, which turned out, turned out to be, thankfully, a very collaborative uh, and open process, uh, which I hope to uh, explain uh, a little bit tonight, or, well, <laughs> to you guys this afternoon, uh, tonight for us. Um, so, yeah, so as I said, I'm going to talk about the process um, a little bit behind uh, creating maps and also how we work together to create them and explain some of the more technical challenges that came up as well uh, from time to time uh, during the process. Um, so let's go to the first slide then. So um, a good place to start is to talk about the inspiration for the style of these maps. Um, both Matt and the design team at Batsford the Publishers uh, made it uh, very clear very early on that uh, they very much like the style of my map of Europe, uh, which we have here on the screen, um, which I designed, uh, which initially I completed in around 2018. And I've kind of gone back to uh, now and again to update uh, and make corrections to. So this was a, a personal project and one of several um, um, maps that I've been creating lately, which uh, basically are an experiment in creating maps with contemporary detail, but in sort of antiquated and old fashioned vintage styles, ranging from, in this case, sort of 19th century antique style to more sort of modern mid century uh, style maps. Mike, I'm just going to interrupt you for one yeah. second. It's Libby. Sorry. If you could press the slideshow button again so everyone can see the full screen, that would be amazing. Oh, beg your pardon. Yeah. No worries. Perfect. Is that better? There we go. Um, so, yeah, where was I? Yeah. So, basically, um, uh, as I said, this is a design which is uh, inspired by 19th century uh, style maps. And you note the color scheme, uh, which is very particular. Uh, which kind of also translated itself into uh, the maps for this book. Um, these are a couple of examples here of um, maps from the from the period. Uh, we can see how again the uh, the use of the type, the color scheme, um, the shading as well around the uh, the coastline, all very much lent themselves to uh, the style of uh, these maps we created for this book. Although one major difference we decided on the end was uh, to change. 
um, uh, the color of the sea from, from gray uh, to a more kind of uh, vibrant uh, pale blue color. Um, so just kind of go through a few examples of uh, the maps that we um, created for the book. Um, starting off with this, this one for Central America. Uh, and so this is a very early rough map, which was created by Matt, uh, for which he did the same for all the other maps as well. Um, and, the, and you can see here how it includes all the, the pins and these annotated instructions um, uh, for me in red, uh, pointing out places where fictional islands should go, um, where there ought to be adjustments to uh, the coastline, other details such as also fictional rivers, even railways, mountains, all these little details. And note that down the center here, uh, you have the sort of the pink, the pink line, uh, which kind of indicates the center of the spread, uh, basically the gutter between the two pages, where the two pages join, um, where it's very important to avoid placing any labels. And obviously with maps with a lot of detail across both pages, it was uh, something very important to, uh, to bear in mind when uh, deciding on the composition of the maps. Um, and in some cases, we had to position the map very carefully on the page to avoid the gutter and also to, to fill the spread effectively. And then moving on to uh, the map of the United States, which is the first one we completed, uh, mainly because it was the biggest and had the, uh, by far the most uh, pins on it. Um, obviously, we've seen a few details from it already in, in, uh, in Reese's uh, part of the talk just now. And this is a very early version of it where I basically have the, the base map uh, established with its colors and uh, certain other incidental details as well, like uh, you can see the road network and the rivers and so on, and even a bit of terrain detail. And uh, a very early version of the, uh, the pins as well, which you may not be able to see very, may not be able to see very, very clearly, um, but you can see they're basically little sort of 3D pins, which in the end we decided to change to much simpler circular pins for, for clarity. And also, I'd also uh, uh, you can see I'd also developed a, a range of illustrations to uh, fit in with the map, uh, which I'd kind of placed in circles around the edge to begin with. Um, that was also to, to be the positions of those was to be developed a little bit a little bit more uh, later on. Uh, the illustrations themselves refer obviously to uh, specific um, sources that are referenced, so certain literary literary uh, sources, certain movies, certain comic books, all kinds of different all kinds of different things. Um, and then, so the process was, so as you can see here, the difference between, you know, how, how it started and then here we have all the pins added. And adding all the pins and labels was primarily Matt's task in this process. Um, so once I had the base map more or less ready to go, it was sent over to Matt, who then had all the locations, you know, he knew where they were all going to be pinned. And it was he who added, added all the pins and labels, as you can see. And then the artwork was sent back to me again afterwards, just to for any sort of last minute adjustments uh, where, where, where they were needed, uh, positions to labels or positions of the illustrations and so on. Um, and this, this map actually in the end was divided into three sections for the book, uh, West, Central and East, simply because it was so large, there was no way it was gonna fit onto a, a single double page spread. Um, but I do still have this, uh, original master design as one single map. So actually, I always thought it'd be like a really cool tie-in with a book to kind of release it as a poster or something. I thought that'd be really cool, but uh, I guess to, uh, to be discussed in future, perhaps. <laughs> but uh, so everyone knows, it does exist. But uh, as well, it also looked quite nice divided into three sections as well, because uh, particularly as well, um, you know, the, 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 two, the two coasts, the east and west coasts, it allows you to zoom in a lot more uh, on the detail on the, in those particular areas, because as you see, when you look closely, there, there are so many pins on there. Um, but moving on to another map, this is a, another one, which I, I, I enjoyed this one immensely, this one of Japan. Um, this, uh, this is at the stage where it was still work in progress here, obviously you can see uh, some more annotations that were added by Matt sort of halfway through the process of putting this map together. Um, showing certain details, like for example, up in the top right, uh, explaining where a new landmass or an island can be drawn in, where there was space. Uh, other small details, like you know, as you can see, like uh, join the, these towns up with a railway, um, add a small island here. Um, so again, just kind of exemplifying the collaborative process of uh, working on these maps. 
Um, and just kind of a, just uh, going behind the curtain a little bit of how the maps that, that this particular map was uh, created. Um, there's a couple of maps I, I, I used here as, as reference, just very simple kind of um, sort of stock maps, uh, especially but particularly the one on the left is very simple, which I used as reference for the coastline and also the uh, the prefecture boundaries. And then on the one on the one the the one on the right uh, proved to be uh, very handy for uh, developing the terrain detail, uh, which I created more or less. Pretty much just from scratch really uh, which i painted in using photoshop using photoshop effects to kind of like have this nice sort of 3d embossed texture and uh which you can see here as an individual uh layer on its own which i then took and then pasted uh, as a layer into the uh, adobe illustrator file um, which was in the end the uh, the software i used to create the maps um, and this is the completed map um where you can see uh how it's populated with their little illustrations there, which uh, themselves also betray the kind of the real vast, uh, the broad uh, range of uh, sources that we've uh, referenced in the book. Uh, so here you can see obviously there's a Gundam robot, you can see there's Godzilla emerging from the waves, uh, there's the floating island of uh, Laputa there from Gulliver's Travels, and uh, at, at the right there next to the inset map of Tokyo there's a kind of like an idealized version of the, I guess Tokyo basically, or uh, any sort of um, generic Japanese city. Um, and then it's worth mentioning as well, like uh, you may uh, also have noticed that all the maps have a particular border around the outside. And um, these borders are all kind of inspired really by each region. Each, each, uh, each map of a different part of the world have, has its own distinct uh, border, which is kind of inspired by kind of uh, historic sort of cultural indigenous uh, design and patterns, just to kind of lend to the theme of each map. Um, so here, just to go through each one from the top left, uh, which is uh, the, the border for the African map. And uh, next to that is the map for uh, the border from the Asian map, the Far East. Um, Australia, obviously very sort of influenced by Aboriginal art there, Native Australian art. Um, one for Western Europe, next to that on the right. And then the, along the bottom, a very simple geometric pattern inspired by Islamic art for the Middle Eastern map. Uh, the one next to that is a pattern inspired by Scandinavia and the Nordic countries. And then the last two, North and South America, respectively, again, sort of referencing sort of indigenous kind of culture. And then moving on to some of the maps, which um, I found particularly challenging to create uh, for various reasons. Um, it's worth mentioning the, the, the map of Canada and Arctic was, uh, the idea was to have the Arctic and Canada in the same map. Um, as you can see here on the initial rough artwork that Matt created and sent to me, um, I mean, the width of that artwork, artwork there, you see, is basically the width of the, the page spread. Um, but then the detail in the map in the middle is quite sort of narrow, and there's a lot of empty space in the middle. So I realized that perhaps using this sort of standard um, projection for Canada and the Arctic region wouldn't really work for a double page spread in this way. Um, so I decided to kind of look at using um, just a portion from um, so a, a projection centered on the North Pole. And this red box kind of just shows the outline of that spread um, and how it would fit. And I, I basically, I just kind of went with this because I realized that it would actually have the dual effect of not only sort of condensing that, that middle part of Canada where there wasn't, where wasn't really any pins at all, but also kind of Sort of stretching it across the double page spread to just make it a bit more of a just kind of filling that spread a bit more efficiently um and this is this is the completed design where which you know at the end of the day is quite quite an unusual um sort of map of canada in that respect in the respect of that it is kind of you know that sort of exaggerated curvature is very unusual you don't really see maps of canada in this way and it makes it unique to this book certainly um, as I said, you know, it gives it allowed me that, um, that, that 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 opportunity to kind of include the Arctic quite comfortably at the top, and we solved the problems of also, you know, the obviously um, as we, as in real life, you know, the population of Canada is mostly along the, the southern border, but uh, also a lot of the fictional locations likewise are all located towards the south. Um, so particularly those in southern Ontario, we decided was better represented in a separate um, map at the top left. And also Prince Edward Island, where obviously a lot of different locations are from uh, Anne of Green Gables, and uh, th those books are all located. 
And then another one, which was also a bit of a challenge, was um, the match, which shows not only the Middle East, but also the Central Asian countries up to Kazakhstan. And there's, there isn't, apart from maps of Asia as a whole continent, there isn't really any uh, precedent for maps which show those two distinct regions in, in one map. So that kind of took a bit of uh, improvisation, really. Um, so what I ended up doing um, was kind of taking uh, those sort of detail from those two separate maps and kind of merging them together into one from two separate maps, um, which those two maps, which themselves were just a sort of flat cylindrical sort of Mercator style projection. Um, and obviously with each of these maps, uh, all of them kind of have a curvature to them. So in order to treat that, it was a case of, again, sort of improvising and uh, using Illustrator to kind of stretch the map in a sort of curve, in a curved way to kind of give an effect of a conic projection, which in the end I think was quite effective, even though it probably possibly isn't 100% technically correct or geographically accurate, but it looks, I think personally, I think it looks good on the page uh, like that. Also, you know, in the process of putting these back together, having to keep in mind the fact where's the position of the gutter, which you can see with this dark gray line in the middle goes straight up through the middle of Iran, up past the Caspian Sea, which in the, it actually turned out to be the area where there were the least number of pins. So in the end, it's a case of just adjusting, tweaking, making sure it's in the right position on the page just to avoid any, any issues. Um, and again, the, the completed artwork. Uh, and you can see I still had quite a bit of excess space on both sides. And I had a number of little illustrations that I could use just to kind of uh, populate those empty spaces. And then lastly, just to talk about um, just a few of the illustrations, because each map has about six or seven, up to eight uh, little illustrations. And I just picked out a few of my favorites, um, some of which I'm sure straight away yeah, you recognize. Um, obviously, we have Nosferatu there uh, at the top left. We have the, the Child Catcher from Chichi Chichi Bang Bang, both of which appear on the, uh, the map of Europe. Uh, there's a castaway figure, which could either represent Robinson Crusoe or, or Tom Hanks in that movie. We have Anne of Green Gables there at the top right. Uh, Father Ted, which is the, um, uh, the British Irish sitcom uh, set in Ireland, uh, which I'm sure many of you hopefully would be familiar with too uh, on Craggy Island. My, my version of Hogwarts School there from Harry Potter. Um, and then the, uh, this, the group portrait of the, the Brontes, the Bronte sisters and their brother, Branwell, uh, which is based on a famous group portrait uh, where Branwell's face is actually you can't actually see it. It's, it's, it's kind of a smudge. But I, I use there's another picture you can find online of, uh, of Bramwell. It's a, a sketch of him by one of his sisters, which I used for his um, appearance in this picture. And here they're basically uh, all sat together looking at a map of their island uh, of Gondol, uh, which is uh, actually set in, uh, I think, in the sort of the, which part of the West, East Pacific? Yeah, the Western Pacific, just off the coast of the Philippines. Uh, and also shaped like Yorkshire, uh, which you see uh, in the little uh, detail there beside the picture, uh, looks just like it. And then a few more, um, Gulliver's Travels represented twice by two separate illustrations. Obviously Gulliver's Travels appears in, on many different pages in the book, um, being set in many different parts around the world. So uh, the one there being terrorized by the giant bee from the land of giants and uh, the second one uh, in the land of the talking horses, uh, the names of which uh, escape me and is quite unpronounceable, but uh, any of you who have read, uh, read or are familiar with that tale will know which one I mean. Um, and then also uh, the Grand Budapest Hotel, obviously quite a recent film. Uh, there's Godzilla again, as we've seen from the Japan map. Um, at the bottom left, uh, the characters from Journey to the East uh, or Journey to the West, is it? Yeah, east or west, I've forgotten, uh, from the map of China. Um, and then I think it was Journey to the West. The West, that's right. I thought, it, yeah, I thought I was wrong at first. <laughs> Thank you, Reese. Um, yeah, so the scene from Moby Dick. Um, and then um, a, a sort of a, quite a sad view of a, a floating plastic pollution in the, in the ocean, which is actually referenced to uh, a gorilla's album. Um, called Plastic Beach, which is uh, an, an, an floating island made of plastic. And uh, finally, uh, the Yellow Submarine uh, Periscope. Um, and in, in many cases, you know, with these illustrations, it was, I suppose we had, we had, we had a slight worry in the back of our minds not to, not to infringe too much on our copyrights or to completely rip off uh, existing uh, interpretations of these uh, sort of literary 
tales and so on. But um, it was good fun, kind of creating new uh, sort of versions of these of these kind of uh, of these characters and settings and scenes. Um, so that's that's it, really. That's my that's my part of the talk over as well. So thank you very much for listening. And I guess I'll hand back to um, Libby. Thanks, everybody. I'll just stop sharing. There we go. That was wonderful. Thank you all so much. We have plenty of time for Q and A. Just um, to give folks uh, a few minutes to start to populate your questions, you can um, drop them right in the Q and A. Um, box at the bottom of your screen, and I will start to go through those in just a second. Um, I just wanted to show for size and scale, this book has a wonderful heft and it's beautifully printed. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a book to treasure. And I was so glad, Mike, that you talked about um, the map of Canada because that's my favorite because I am a, an Anne of Green Gables lover from way back. So I was delighted to see Prince Edward Island and Anne so prominently featured in so many of the very real places um, on PEI that are featured in the my beloved childhood uh, novels. So I also have another fun thing for those of you who are um, attending today, we are going to randomly draw five names and we will send the five winners, um, a copy of the book, which we are delighted to do as a thank you for tuning in with us today. Um, uh, apologies for interrupting. Yeah, Libby. There was one thing I quickly want to say, something I forgot to say during the actual uh, presentation. I had it on my notes, but by the end, <laughs> I was on such a roll, I'd stopped using the notes. <laughs> Um, I just want to say a special thank you to Steve Collins of the Lewiston Sun Journal. He gave us a wonderful uh, bit of coverage in the Sun Journal with a review of the Atlas. And I understand it's through that that you good people at the university uh, learnt about it. And so without his article, this would not be possible. So a very special thank you to Steve Collins. Thank you. And we will send him the recording as well, because that's definitely where we first heard of this incredible Atlas. So. Just a quick, I'm such a process nerd, so I really enjoyed the whole talk from that perspective. Matt, just a quick question for you, and then I'm gonna start. There, there's a lot of questions popping up and I'll start asking, but from conception of the idea, Matt, when you first thought of this thing to the actual publication of the book this past fall, what was the time scope of this entire project? There we are, I'm muted. Um, yeah, it's, it's a good question. I, I, as I sort of said in my introduction, um, it gets a bit vague because it was projects merging into each other and I'm not quite sure where the idea first uh, hit me that this could be an atlas. But um, I think we had, after we did Fake Britain, we had about two years between that moment and the publication of the book. So we effectively um, were working on it for one and a half to two years, I'd say. Uh, and most of that was doing the initial research, finding the locations, sticking them in a spreadsheet and doing my rough maps. When we got Mike involved, it all sped up quite a bit and he was producing these wonderful maps. And that, that was a slightly quick stage. It's the research and the figuring out. I mean, you, when you first start thinking, how many places are we gonna find in Canada? You don't know what kind of projection to do you don't know whether to just focus on the south bit of Canada where you think all the towns are going to be you've got to actually make a map yourself to know in the first place so making those rough early maps was the most time consuming part and I think yeah nearly two years I think we're doing it that's uh remarkably quick for the amount of work <laughs> that went into making this no well, doubt we were in some ways assisted by the pandemic we had a little bit more time on our hands I mean I've got two kids so I also had to look after their schooling at the same time I think Mike's got kids as well there were other demands on our time of course but um, I was furloughed from my my main role so I did have a bit more time than I would have anyway so it helped but it I, obviously I wouldn't um, I'm not glad there was furlough and pandemic but it did help us to some degree that is uh, and that's actually was one of the inspirations for our current exhibition that is up now about fantasy mapping as actually as an escape from the pandemic to give people a moment to kind of immerse themselves in fictional worlds. So let me start turning to all of these questions from Francesca. Um, she asks, to prepare yourself to draw these maps, did you look at historical maps of mythical places like representations from Dante's Inferno? And from that, where are you positioning yourself 
in the history of book interpretation through drawing and mapping? Whew, who wants to tackle that? That's a big question. Um, <laughs> or you can tackle them one at a time. The first one's probably for Mike. Were you looking at mythical maps as well? Yes. Um, yeah, when that was mentioned, it did come to mind actually that. So I remember Matt did share a, a few examples of um, sort of uh, old, not, not, not necessarily fantasy maps, but certainly maps from history, uh, particularly when it comes to, came to uh, things like um, sort of uh, fictional land, not fictional, what am I trying to think of, like uh, land masses which were imagined to be there on old maps, on antique maps, especially in the middle of the Atlantic and things like this. Um, so they, they, they were quite a, a handy reference for that kind of thing. And uh, also in, in many cases where um, there's a whole kind of universe and a whole kind of online community, um, you know, uh, focused on particular, particular video games or stories or comics, you often find a website where they may have like people have posted all kinds of um, bespoke maps and all kinds of things that kind of illustrate, you know, all these locations. And they, they you know, without wishing to, obviously, I didn't want to uh, completely rip off all those uh, examples uh, myself, but they, they came very handy when it came to sort of figuring out how they would be, appear on the map or, or how they sort of related to each other geographically or, yeah, okay, that, 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 that's right. Thank yeah, you. and of course, we've all sort of been map geeks all our lives, so we, we, there's all kinds of inspirations feeding into this. Um, I, I, I know, as kind of side note to this, is things like the fantasy maps of Tolkien and, um, and Raymond E. Feist was one of my favourites growing up, and, and uh, Robert Jordan, all these, these fantasy realms, um, and even The Wizard of Oz. They're all very inspiring to us, but we couldn't really include them in our atlas because they're all set in on either on other planets or the land masses, or in Tolkien's case, it's supposed to be Middle Earth is a, a representation of our Earth in a very different geological time period. So those fantasy epics, sadly, they, they didn't really fit the, the scope of our, our atlas. We only plotted things that fit into our modern contemporary Earth. I did argue that we could have included Oz. Yes, that's another because uh, uh, Oz <laughs> appears to be somewhere on Earth. Uh, Dorothy washes up there in one of the books after falling overboard a ship traveling from San Francisco to Australia, and you can see the North Star from Oz, meaning it's somewhere in the Northern Hemisphere and somewhere in the Pacific, at least as I interpret it. <laughs> so your uh, your comment, Matt, answered a lot of questions that people were having about where is Middle Earth and where have all of these things. So you're mapping places on the actual earth so because you had to have some rules or that's right. 700 pages <laughs> we had some very serious rules which we go into in some depth in the introduction and then we broke most of those rules when we found <laughs> really interesting or fun examples that broke the rules in some way something like middle earth it would, it would have been fun to map but people have already mapped that i mean tolkien himself his books have always got that map in so we're not really adding anything new um so it not only broke our rules it, it wouldn't have been novel or interesting from a, from a new standpoint um yeah our rules our rules were kind of it had to be reasonably accurately mappable so if we knew some a place was say in spain but that's all we knew and we couldn't find any details. We couldn't tell which way the sun was rising from or, or whatever. Uh, we'd probably leave it out unless it was super, super famous and had to go in there. Um, likewise, if somewhere didn't have a name, like Reese uh, went into some depth there about short circuit and the big city and that not having a name, um, even though the city might be well realized, if it didn't have a name, we tended to leave it out. Um, so those, those were kind of our rules. Um, and then there's an interesting mix of places that are semi-real so most people will be familiar certainly UK readers with the novels of Thomas Hardy Mayor of Casterbridge those those novels they're all set in the sort of south and southwest of England um, he uses fictional place names for all his places um, but they map one-to-one -one onto real towns and real cities uh, Christminster and um, Casterbridge itself they're 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 stand-ins for real towns in, in the UK so they're very easy to map and they're, they're a shade they're not quite as fantastic and fabulous as a totally invented city. They have some basis in reality. So the introduction to the book also goes into some detail on, on those different shades of fiction and shades of reality. Thank you. I'm gonna read, read Tim's question, um, which is a, a, a short question, but a longly framed, but funny. So I wanna read it for that reason too. So he thanks you for a remarkably fun project. Um, 
So he sees lots of maps from film and TV and literature. And so he's curious about music. Have you done any mapping from songs? Where's that town called Malice? Am I a Mainer anywhere near the Big Rock Candy Mountain? If we're all gonna get together at a little old place called the Love Shack, 15 miles outside of Atlanta, but in which direction? Could I afford a ticket to Suffragette City after all? Um, so talk a little bit about uh, the inclusion of music in the Atlas. Well, I, know I know we've got Margaritaville. <laughs> and I know that we've got Big Rock Candy Mountain. Was that the Zappa one? There's a um, Frank Zappa, what's his name? I, we, we had a few, didn't we? There was, there was a mountain from a song. Um, oh, Billy the Mountain. Billy the Mountain. I, I, I've never heard the song in my life, um, but I remember that one being in there. Uh, so Big Rock County Mountain, not mapped, but Billy the Mountain, I think, is. Yes. yes I, I've just checked our, spread, our spreadsheet. Yeah. Um, the Love Shack would have been great. I didn't realise that it's outside Atlanta. I missed that lyric. Uh, that we should make a note of that for a future edition. Yeah, there's so many. Uh, someone just inquired um, uh, uh, in chat, like, uh, you know, where's Crab Apple Co from MASH? And then it was pointed out by Steve Collins in the Lewiston Sun Journal. That's one of the places we missed. Um, if we ever do get a second edition, Crab Apple Cove will be added in along with a bunch of other places that have been pointed out. And we're always welcoming more feedback. To go back to music, there were, there were, I think there's probably about a dozen from music in there. I can't remember the specific examples. Things like Town Called Malice. I, I don't think there's any more clues in that song. I'm just trying to go over the lyrics in my head, but where would you put it? Would you put it next to mm. Alice Springs? Or I don't yeah, I suppose we could have done. Um, I think, I think but, I read, uh, um, sorry, Matt, I think I read that Paul Weller based it on his own hometown, Woking in, in the Southeast. I think I read that somewhere once. Although, whether, that's, whether that's true, I don't know. It might just be someone making that up. I don't know. <laughs> you see, this is the problem. It's, a, it's an infinite project. There's always, mm. um, was it Donald Rumsfeld who talked about his unknown unknowns? And um, trying to find the stuff that the three of us aren't ourselves aware of is, is a challenge. Um, I don't know if anyone's asked a question about how we did do our sourcing and we did find all these places. Um, that was just, to... Eva Jane was asked that very question. So go ahead and yeah. How'd you get it? Them was all? my introduction and I forgot, but um, it's a bit of everything. But so first of all, Reese and I just brainstormed everything we knew from personal memory and things and um, a really useful source. Now, um, everyone says bad things about Wikipedia all the time, but it's very, very, very good if you just want a sort of starting point. If you want a, um, a list of, there are lists on Wikipedia, like a list of fictional prisons, a list of fictional countries. They're great starting points. So I think we, we did spend a lot of time going to finding every list we could on Wikipedia, obviously verifying everything that's in those lists, but it was great for pointing us in the right directions. Um, and then we did a little bit of crowdsourcing. So the UK map, the, the Britain map, um, was mostly crowdsourced through Londonist uh, in the first instance. Um, other maps, we didn't really have that resource to do that, but we did all, con we, we contacted friends and family in different countries around the world, got them to ask their friends and contribute places that we wouldn't necessarily have known about. Um, and then just random Google searches, like you search for a fictional city in Australia and see what comes up. And again, always checking that what comes up is accurate, but uh, you use those kind of tactics to find them in the first place. We have um, a question from, oh, go ahead. Uh, sorry, no, someone was just asking if we've had any feedback from actual creators. Um, I know of two. Uh, one is Jacopo Della Quercia. It's a pen name for an Obama staffer who uh, pin, who paired up with Shakespearean writer Ian Desher to create a, a work called McTrump, a parody of the Trump administration. And that took a number of relocations from the USA and turned them into Shakespearean things. For example, Mar Mariago became, sorry, Mar-a-Lago became Mar-Iago. Shakespearean style. Uh, I know that he's a bit, he's aware of this. I'm friends with him on Twitter, and he's overjoyed at this. I also know that Chris Hazelton, the creator of the web comic Misfile, which I mentioned during my bit, he's aware because I messaged him, and he was delighted. That's great, and I'm sure I'm sure you'll hear from more people too as more and more people read read the book. Uh, we have a question from a student from Wolverhampton University in the UK. Um, and I'm going to direct this one at you, Mike. Um, mm -hmm. She thanks you for the talk, and she is an aspiring map illustrator, um, currently studying illustration at Wolverhampton. And 
what research advice might you give to anyone looking to develop an illustrated map on their own as a personal project for a student who's starting out with this? Wow, gosh. Um, yeah, I don't know, really, because it's it very much depends on what your own interests are. Um, you know, I see a lot of map illustrators online who, you know, really do specialize in a particular kind of theme, you know, whether it be fantasy maps, Lord of the Rings based you know, style maps. Um, you know, whereas I suppose with, with mine, you could sort of, you know, it's, it's a lot broader in terms of the sort of subject matter. Um, but it really just kind of, it's, it's really just a case of um, pursuing a particular line of maps uh, that, that interests you or what you would you know, love to create yourself on a regular basis if, if you wish to be kind of um, creating it, uh, for, for creating them for, uh, for a living. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's kind of focusing on that and then kind of just uh, developing a, maybe a particular style, just kind of creating a little niche uh, for yourself, really, in that kind of, in, that, in, in the business. Um, that's where I, that's, 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 that's pretty much how I would, um, how I would uh, go about it if I was starting all over again. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to choose one of Mike's questions um, from the chat and he asks, are there any thoughts or of pursuing otherworldly maps? You'd have plenty of work on Mars alone trying to reconcile the stories of C.S. Lewis, Edgar Rice Burroughs, and Ray Bradbury. So any, any outer planet otherworldly maps yes. that we're making? <laughs> Excellent question. And um, I always had in mind that this would be the start of going beyond this world. I'm a big sci-fi fan. I think Reese is too. Um, I've all, <laughs> I'm already talking to our publishers uh, about a range of options and going off world is certainly one of those. Um, I'm a big Star Trek fan and the events of the last uh, Star Trek Picard series, uh, there's, all, there's all kinds of stuff on there um, just for Mars and, and the moon and invasion fleets around the earth who's tried to invade us over the century of sci-fi or, or more than a century. Um, so definitely, there's definitely a, a scope for an off-world one. Um, the other idea we had, and we trialled this on Londonist as well, is to really focus in on big cities like London, New York, potentially Boston, uh, San Francisco, LA, Paris, the places that have given us lots of fiction over the centuries, and do minute mapping of those. So where do all the characters live? Obviously, Sherlock Holmes, we all know he lives 221B Baker Street, but all the other fictional characters who've lived in London, where did they live? and uh, fictional buildings, fictional. So doing city maps in the same style. So it wouldn't necessarily be fictional place names, but it's where fictional characters have lived and fictional businesses are based, that kind of thing. Um, so again, I pitched that to our publisher. Uh, a third idea I had as well, which is not so much mapping, it's, it's playing on this idea of fiction and, and facts merging together and doing a kind of fictional encyclopedia. So you'd have a fi fictional chronology of the world, all the things that have happened, historical events that never really happened, but did in fiction. Historical list of presidents of the United States. We all know them from like Independence Day and different films and things. Just doing a chronological list of those and a fictional periodic table of the elements. I'm a chemist by training, so I'd love to map kryptonite and uh, adamantine from Wolverine or whatever it's called. Just put together like a, an encyclopedia of fictional stuff. So we've got various ideas. There's there's lots of scope here for, for sequels. And uh, I'm having encouraging talks at the moment with the publisher, but um, so watch this space. That's really exciting. There are a lot of questions about what's going to come next. So that's a lovely preview. Um, there are a lot of questions about how you use the Atlas. So is there a guide or an index? Is there a gazetteer? Will you talk a little bit about the structure in that way? Me or Reese or anybody? Um, you go for it, Matt. I, I, okay. I'm I'm answering a, a few questions via type. Okay, you do that. Um, yeah, great question. Um, so I've got the book here. Uh, there's um there's a lengthy introduction. It's like ten pages or so. It just sort of sets out all these sort of things. Many of the questions you're you're, you're asking are set out there. Um, each territory, each map, we've got eighteen different maps. Um, well, actually, more because USA split into three, for example. Um, and each one comes with, I think it's four pages at least. Uh, so we, you get little essays about uh, some of the, the more important uh, more, or more interesting, intriguing uh, places on, on that given map. And then with each map, you also get uh, where we, we, we sort of drill in more detail into some of them and, and the sleuthing we went to to, to locate uh, where they are. And then, of course, at the end, you've got a, a two full indexes. You won't be able to read that, but uh, it's quite small type. Um, all 5,000 locations are indexed. 
and all the source places are also indexed in a separate index. So a big thank you to our indexer who it must have taken them ages to put this together. Um, but there's, there's, I don't know, I've not counted them, but there's 30 or 40 pages of index in this thing as well. Oh, more than that, actually. Um, so you get everything, the, the, you, every single pin in there, you'll be able to see where it came from, uh, the source material, whether it's TV, film, etc. And quite often we also go into detail about why we put it in a particular location. That's fantastic. Um, I want to give an extra special thank you to Reese for answering so many questions in the chat as quick as they're coming up. And as we're over our time, which I knew we would be, I want to end with one question that I'll put to all three of you because it's a it's a great one for any any author because there's always something that you wish was in here. So Chris asks, what do you most wish made it into the book but had to be left out? Um, for me, I think it would be Johnny Five City because I put so much effort into that. <laughs> but it did. Uh, I, I, I'm beginning to think we could have credited it as the big bad city. <laughs> but um, um, that's the one that I wish could have been kept. But the fact that we couldn't map it did give wonderful, uh, wonderful material for a little article. Hmm. For me, it's not so much a place or a thing. It's it's just the idea that new stuff is released all the time, and and you miss stuff as well. And so not long after the. Book appeared. I watched Snowpiercer, that uh, bizarre film about the train that goes all the way around the world in some and a TV books. series now. Yeah, and a TV series, which would have been great to map. We'd have a train line running through every single map, pretty much. Uh, and so for me, it's things like that, and the, the Zindi Trench from Star Trek, uh, Star Trek Enterprise, where there's this huge trench is carved into Florida and Georgia. Uh, I, for some reason, I mean, that was always in my mind from the start of these books, and I forgot. To to put it in there so it's not one particular thing it's this idea that you can never have it all um which also um that could be a, another sequel is not do it as a book do it as a website which we can update and keep edited and you can zoom in on any level you want that's a huge project and uh i don't know that would keep us going for the rest of our lives wouldn't it but um yeah that's my answer mike do you have anything yeah um yeah i was just thinking about this i mean the only thing i, I could think of is like Quite close to the end of the project um i remember because I'm, I'm a big uh, wes anderson aficionado and i love all his films and uh i remember i was i was sending matt like a list of all these uh, lo uh potential locations from wes anderson films and saying oh maybe we should include all these as well uh but in the end it was a little bit too late because it was already due to go to print so um i think they'll have to wait until the next uh edition hopefully if we can fit those in too i hope there will be a, a next edition <laughs> Someone so. said Hunger Games, that's all where we've got every single, yeah, all the different territories from that. Pan Am, sorry. Oh, fabulous. And it's as a kid, I, I, when I first read the Hunger Games, I thought it was literally just a pun on Pan American. It was only later I realized Pan Am is bread, bread and circuses. Mm. I think it's the, I mean, the mapping of this is is infinite. And I just have to say, you know, as someone I appreciate a book that you can open to any page and just sort of be drawn into it. You could read it in order, but you don't have to. I mean, there's so many different ways that you can kind of plot your own adventure through this book and then return to your own favorite stories as you're as you're doing it. So I want to offer my thanks for your time and generosity, everyone. This was a fantastic presentation. There are so many good wishes and comments in the chat and thank yous. So we will pass those along to you friends. And this is being recorded. So we will um, be posting in the next week or two uh, on our website, oshermaps.org. Um, there's a news and events section, and we always add the recording of a talk if the presenters allow it right up there so you can find it easily. Um, and also on our YouTube channel, you can just look for the OSHA Map Library on that one. So on behalf of all of us, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. You. <laughs> Reese and Matt and Mike for a wonderful afternoon. Live long and prosper. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everybody. We will talk to you soon and uh, please come and see North of Nowhere, West of the Moon, which was actually based on a British map um, from 1918 of Fairyland uh, by Bernard Slay, um, which we have the six foot version hanging in our gallery right now. So, so many worlds to discover. Thanks everybody. And we will see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.